All right, here we go. What's your discipline? In life, everything matters. So show up every day, even when it's hard. Jocko Fuel uses clean fuel with raw ingredients from supplements, protein shakes, energy drinks, and more. Speaking of which, I drink the Sour Apple Sniper during my workouts, and it has changed everything. The way I run, lift, and even think. You can too. Get yours today by going to Jocko Fuel website and enter promo code RAISEREFLECTION to get 10% off your order. Again, raise reflection, 10% off your order. At Jocko Fuel, there is no shortcut. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Rays Reflection Podcast. Always free to subscribe wherever you are listening. All you have to do is just click that button. Subscribe. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, iHeartRadio, and follow me on the socials at I'm Nathaniel Reyes. That's with A-E-L at the end of Nathaniel. Now, before we get started with this episode, I want to give some love to my partners, Mad Rabbit, Tattoo Aftercare Skin Products. If you need to revitalize your ink, heal your new tattoo, or if you're just looking to get your first, they have many products that you can go check out. Simply go to www.madrabbit.com and use promo code RAISEREFLECTION for 20% off. And Jocko Fuel, limited edition pumpkin protein powder is back for a short time for the Halloween season. 10% off, Ray is reflection. Use the code. Now, on to the introduction of my guest. If you have been listening to Boston Radio, you are no stranger to this individual. But I'm going to do my best to encapsulate all that he does. He hosted nights for Kiss 108, made a pit stop at 96.9, now has his own show weekdays. 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Country 102.5. That is his part-time job, though, because full-time, he is a family man and a spreader of love. So without further ado, Jackson Blue, welcome to the pod. Yo, man, I have to give you, I'm starting with uh, with uh, a compliment for you because I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts, and I think you do such a great job at your intros, which I don't know how you find some stuff out that you do, and... Uh, Especially your listening skills. I want to compliment you on that because it seems like you know what you want to talk about, but then you let the people go and you listen very well to be able to ask questions off of that instead of sticking to your, your list of questions. So good job, man. I think you do a really good job with your podcast. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me when I hear someone in the media space compliment me. I'm just an individual who likes to talk. So the fact that you say this is just is it's an absolute the words are very encouraging so thank you, you don't so even much. understand you have skills right now that people in radio don't have like podcasters have skills that radio people don't have i can talk real good for 12 seconds but you put me on for 45 minutes and you're about to see what happens yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so we're gonna get rolling then so i want to start off the gate with this this is the first time I, i've ever really talked to you face to face we talked uh on social media and email that's how we corresponded so I want to break the ice right now, okay? So we're about to get a little, we're about to get comfortable with each other, almost like a trust fall, okay? So Jackson, how is your penis? Hey, there it is. I was wondering, okay. Did you give me a womp womp about my penis? I, I did about me asking the question. It better be about you asking the penis and not about my penis. Because as you know, the reason why you're asking about my penis is because I just went through a medical thing where I had to have a catheter in my penis and it was the worst experience of my life. And if, when that catheter comes out of your penis, for anybody who's listening right now, just know. It's probably my biggest piece of advice that I have right now. Your penis is going to get tiny for a little while, but it comes back. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm lucky that I've never had that experience, so I, I'm glad that I don't have that, and I've never have, and I hope I never will. I but... hope you never have to do, but file it in the back of your mind that no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad the procedure that you just had, yep. when you find out you have a catheter in your penis and they're about to yank that thing, that's when stuff's about to get real. All right, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's real. Okay, all right. So as you mentioned, for context, so that doesn't yeah. get clipped up of where I just mentioned your penis. You, <laughs> you, you had a recent surgery, right? So how are you doing post-op? I'm doing great, thank you. So like, I think, and I think this is something that's kind of like a, a theme in my life is, is really like, I like to take on challenges. And this isn't something I wanted to take on at all, you know, like, but big things that will happen. I, I kind of like to try to do it just to prove that I can do it. Or even now that I'm starting to get a little bit older, God, this gray is showing up a lot on this camera. I just shaved my goatee yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, you look great, man. You look like you got me by at least 20 something years, but the, uh, 
Um, I don't even remember where I was going. That's what happens when you get old. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm about to, I'm about to turn 30 in, in two months. So I, I, I don't know. About that. Yeah. You know, I, I think I've grown and gracefully, I, I'm accepting it because I feel like maybe, I mean, I don't know. You, you kind of just shit on yourself there for me. I, I feel like I am aging like a fine wine. I don't know. May, maybe that's just me. I don't know. I feel like I think you are for 30 years old. You look good. I feel like I look better now than I did when I was like 20. I feel like when I was 20, I looked awkward and I was almost still in that awkward middle school, high school. It was almost like my life. I feel like my life, everything got delayed a little bit. That was my awkward years, you know, where I was getting rejected by girls all the time, all that jazz. And now as I'm getting older, it's a little bit different. I feel like, you know, I've grown into myself a little bit more. And I think that happens with age and maturation for men. I, I feel think like. Luckily for some people, it does. If you eat right and you don't like go and get crazy and do that kind of stuff, you know, like or fall into the drinking trap, which I did for a long time. Yeah. That's another thing. So these are those big things where I'm talking about, about getting over things. Yep. Where, like, I quit drinking in the last, like, two years ago. Congratulations. Which I drink a lot. You know, thank you, thank you. And, and I, I loved drinking, and I, I honestly still do love drinking. And I know it's something that people probably don't want to hear. It didn't work well for me, you know what I mean? Like, so right. quitting was very hard at that point. Another, like, major thing that I would change is, like, you know, going from – like I started on Kiss 108, like you said, doing nights. I went from there and I moved down to Dallas, Texas, because I wanted to I wanted to prove that, like, you know, radio DJs that work in Boston traditionally kind of get typecasted. Like we've become we're Boston jocks, you know. Yeah. So when you start looking at back when I was a little bit younger, they started giving national looks to all these people for the company that I was working for. And I noticed a lot of people from New York and L.A. and Chicago and I was like, what's up with Boston? How come Boston never gets the looks in there? And so, uh, you know, I decided I had to make a big change and go down to Dallas, Texas to show that I'm not just a Boston jock, which I, I loved Dallas. It was a great couple of years, but I, I didn't plan on doing that. I did it just as a proof of concept to be like, listen, man, you guys got to start taking me a little more seriously here. And then I moved to Baltimore and I did that for a couple of years. And then when I came back, I decided to take even bigger changes where it was, I was back at Kiss 108 and I was like, you know what, let's switch it up. And I went to the hip hop station. I went to Hot 96.9 where it was all the jamming 94.5 people. And then I was the nerdy Kiss 108 dude that came and tried to rock, you know, like, but the thing that I've learned through all of it, through every, everything all the way through all the big challenges and all that is like, I love paying attention to like sociology. If I, if I weren't a mass comm major, I probably should have been sociology because I love seeing why people believe what they believe or what makes a person who they are and the commonalities that people have. And, and I think the thing that I've gotten to see in working in radio and traveling around all these things and doing country and hip hop and pop in Texas and Baltimore and, and Boston and other places is just that we're all the same, man. If, if you just act your true self and you're just you, then people can't fault you for anything because that's who you are. You know what I mean? Like, so if I'm corny and yes, I am corny a little bit and my jokes are a little bit corny sometimes. I get it. But that's who I am. So if you have a problem with that, I can get mad at you. <laughs> right. No, I, I, mean, I mean, kudos to you for making that transition because that is a big transition, just leaving New England because you, you've grown up there and you've always wanted to be in radio. You wanted to be in radio since you were nine years old. I think I saw something that said that. And so the fact that you made that transition to just prove that to yourself I think that a lot of people don't do that type of stuff. But it also, not only did you expand your portfolio, you also gave yourself an obstacle that you overcame because you noticed something of, hey, how come Boston isn't getting this love? And you're right. I have seen that too. I, I feel like you're right. I feel like for some reason, geographically, this area gets known for, you know, their, uh, their one, their accent, their personalities. We're like rough around the edges. That's what we're deemed as. So because of that, do you know people from Chicago. Like, do you know people? Yeah, I was gonna. No, I, New, York, New York. They're just like that too. Come on, man. Like, I was gonna say that. I was gonna say. I feel like they are like that as well. And and it's it's. I don't know. I just feel like that. You doing that. I I, I commend that because I think that that's that that's incredibly brave and and impressive that you were able to just transition your life from what you've known. And you got to see some scenery in your younger years. You got that experience. So I think that those were probably great experiences, which has helped you present day and being able to do the work that you do. Yeah, best experiences of my life, no doubt. And I think what it really did is like, 
it made me better on the radio and to understand all that stuff, but it really just made me better in life, you know, like not only interpersonal and all that, but as a father, like with my, my kids, like there's so much that I got to learn through talking to people and meeting people that weren't me, like exactly like me. That was awesome that I can now pass on to my daughters. And now they have that as a starting ground to start moving. You know, it's, it's cool. And, and, and you being a dad doing what you're doing, you want your kids to have a better head start than you. That's so you being able to share that wisdom with them, they will be able to now, whereas you had to learn that now you are able to bestow your experiences on them. And now they're able to have that head start and being like, Hey, my dad taught me this, but nonetheless, I think that that is an awesome thing for your daughters to be yeah, able to have. It's really interesting for kids, man. Like, Think about every generation. Every generation is trying to course correct the generation before them. Yeah, you know, like yep. my parents were awesome. I love my parents, you know, but there were things that were like not cool, like that I look back at now and I'm like, wow, we were a little bit like a cult. I got to fix that a little bit, you know, like, so I'm trying to fix that. Yep. But at the same time, I, I always will like look back after like a month or whatever and just look back at how I've been doing, even as a parent. And I'll be like, damn, there were some annoying things about me. I got annoyed here and here and here. And I'm like, that's what Lily and Chloe are going to have to fix when they get older. <laughs> A lot of self-reflection. I feel like as a parent, your whole perspective of life, because now your job is no longer about you, it's about protecting and raising. And I, I, I think I read something one time that said, it's crazy, when you purchase a TV or a car, there's like a 50-page manual of instructions on how to operate that. But then you have a child, and there's nothing that comes with it. Here's this human that you are it's your job now it's your responsibility to try to raise and to be an upstanding citizen in society so right. it's not like the tv where if you fuck it up then you're like oh i'll just go buy another one i'll have to get one half price because that was expensive <laughs> but whatever <laughs> yeah no you, you can't the other thing is everybody also has something to say when you become a parent too everybody all of a sudden is like oh you're a new parent and everybody thinks you want to hear like their best piece of like advice and it's yeah. like Shut up, man. Let me just do my own thing a little bit. Like, thank you, but... Uh, You're an expert. Everyone's an expert. That's what it is. Everyone's an expert on everything. Yeah, exactly. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. So I want to I wanna circle back with your surgery. You had to convert your basement into a studio. Is that is that correct? Because you... Yes, got, we is, got right here. I should turn the lights on or something, but... Uh, yeah. So I, and that kind of had to do with uh with COVID as well. So because of the COVID thing, everybody started working from studios at home. Okay. I also like I've already had a studio because I, I do a national show. So I'm on like 45 radio stations across the country for United Stations Radio Network, which is a big radio network. Okay. Thing. Um. So I do a show from my studio every morning before I do anything, and then I uh and then I go to work and I do the Boston show. So I, I already had a studio set up, which was real handy. Okay. But during, that was another one of those challenges, like where. I'm weird where I I want people I want to over deliver all the time, you know what I mean? Like so I wanted my goal was I was I was struggling like crazy. So basically what happened? You want me to give the nuts and bolts on the surgery? Absolutely. Like, Absolutely, yeah. I, I really apologize. But like I basically had woke up and I I'm, I'm kind of like 40 something but I'm also still like a dumb I'm a little kid. I'm still in my ugly duckling phase, you know? Like <laughs> I thought I had bumped into something from doing something stupid or doing a cartwheel or doing something dumb. So I had like some pain down here, like in my, in my appendix area. Okay. So, but I thought it was fine. My wife is a nurse at mass general. So she kind of like stayed on top of me in a little bit. Once she realized I kind of was like really hurting a little bit like after a couple of days, she sent me to the ER. So I went to the ER, they checked me out and they said they, they did some scans and they're like, Oh, you have a burst appendix. So now I'm laying in the hallway at South shore hospital like, cause that's how it is now. And, and it's not even a temporary thing laying in hallways at hospitals anymore. Cause I was laying there and I'm like, this is really weird. There's somebody down the hall, like right below where my feet are. That's where their head is. And that there, that's their room. And I look over on the, the hallway wall and they have up on the wall a now permanent thing that says room, whatever it was room 142 or something like that. And I'm like, this is the worst room I've ever been in in a hospital. But anyway, so they checked the scans. They said I had a burst appendix. So I think when I'm a kid, that's the last thing I burst appendix, septic, possible death and that's what i'm thinking while i'm laying there and i'm like but i feel just fine okay so i'm laying there waiting and they keep coming over to me and they're like oh, they're gonna get you in right away don't worry um it's gonna be okay and i'm like I i'm all right don't worry they put me in there before i go in the, the surgeon who's awesome um had a meeting with me and, and told me everything that it was gonna be a laparoscopic surgery so they were gonna make a tiny hole and just go in through there and i was gonna be out same day or next day and uh they were just gonna take care of the appendicitis get rid of the appendix good to go so I guess 
they get in there and it wasn't what they thought. They saw the appendix and the appendix was 100% fine. Like there was nothing wrong with the appendix, which they thought was burst. And I thought I was septic and dying from. So I'm now obviously out cold. They see that. And then they're like, well, well, that's weird. And my surgeon is, he's a rock star. Everybody knows it. And uh, I guess he had never seen anything like this. Didn't really know what was going on. Looked over, I guess, on my, um, over on my colon, there was a growth about the size of a golf ball on there. So he got nervous, took that thing off, took a portion of my colon out of there, went back and took the, the appendix because he's in there. You don't need it anyway. So he's just going to take that out. Closed me up. So I wake up and that's when I found out I had, uh, he's like, you know what? It was different than we thought. Um, he was just, just him and me in the room. I thought Kristen was there, my wife, but, but I think I was so high on drugs at that point. I don't really know. It's a, but I remember him telling me that it's, you know, it was explaining the whole thing that the appendix was fine. We found a growth on your colon. We had to take out a portion of your colon. We're going to send that for, for pathology. And then, you know what, we're going to, we're going to do this like checkers and chess and checkers is going to be healing all of this, the stuff that we just cut you open with, which takes a long time. And then after that, we're going to do chess, which is going to be taking care of the cancer and, and treating the cancer and, you know, whatever, whatever that in, entails. So we started talking about chemotherapy and all that, all those possibilities. My wife has gone through cancer two times in one year, which was nuts that were totally unrelated wow. and very young. She did col a breast and colon in the same year. So I thought my wife has done this. This is just my turn. I got to take care of it and we'll do it. And at that time I had started making videos like, because I wanted to be fully open about everything. And I wanted to be honest about things that I think people aren't always honest about, about right. like things that are great, but I also didn't want to overstate how good I was doing or how well things were, because I wanted people to know that things are shitty. Like they're not that great. And this is real, this is reality, but I'm going to be positive as hell through this entire thing. And we're going to make it through it. And you're going to see, if you follow my videos, that you could be positive and make it through shit, you know, which we all do all the time. Yeah. So I started going for it. And at that point, when I started talking about, because my doctor, my surgeon was talking straight up about cancer. So at that point, I think I have cancer. It's, you know, you have a, a growth on your colon that's about the size of a, a golf ball. And what else are you going to think it is? So I started, you know, I'm being pretty open about it, that the pathology has to come back. We don't know anything, blah, blah, blah. But all the cancer community then starts reaching out to me and being so supportive. And the people that came out with support were phenomenal. But now, later on, I started getting the hint that, like, maybe something would, like, the pathology took forever, by the way, like, way, way, weeks and weeks. So I'm sitting there in limbo, not knowing whether or not I have cancer and, you know, what the plan, even start thinking about the plan. Right, yeah, what the action sure. is. Yeah. And I know people have gone through that thousands of times over. I, I wasn't aware because I never had to go through it myself. But waiting for a pathology when you're waiting on something with that magnitude is wild. Um, but the thing that really stunk was and was a blessing was when I, I i got a hint that i i that things were looking pretty good in my pathology but they didn't have results back so at that point i'm like oh my gosh i think things might be okay and then when the pathology came back they told me there was no cancer everything was fine i was clear and at that point i i had this guilt that hit me you know what i mean like i was still healing and things were not good i was still pretty much open and and not back to who i should be at all and I'm dealing with all that. But at the same time, I have this real bad guilt because now I had this feeling of like this cancer community has reached out to me and been so supportive of me. And I really wanted to be a champion for them like in a small role, even, you know, like where I can take it on and like go through the chemo or go through whatever it is that I'm going to go through and be honest about it and keep making these videos and get through it positively. And then eventually show people that it's OK, that we can do this, you know, and discuss it openly with a community and things like that 100 yeah. percent. answer questions honestly if things suck i'll tell you they suck if things are going well i'll tell you that you know and be fully real and open about it but then it got cut off thank god because i didn't have to deal with cancer but then it made me feel awful because i had this community that had been so supportive for me that i really wanted to take care of that now i'm not a part of and i have to just be like thanks guys but i'm good you know what i mean like that yeah that was a little messed up for me to have to try to do yeah yeah that's that that i mean that's tough because you really didn't know. You didn't know. It, but, I mean, I think that if there's, any, if there's any way to ease it, it's not like you were misleading. It's just you sure. were unaware and, that, and you were trying My to figure out. My intentions were all positive and, and in the right place. Yes. But, anyway, it, it was a weird thing where I, I – I, and I knew I had to announce it on social media because that's where I was doing everything. 
but I didn't want to come out and be like, guys, guess what? I don't have cancer. You know what I mean? Like right. now I have those people that I'm trying to like, I want to be there with these people. So it, it just, I felt really bad for feeling so happy about something. Uh, and now I understand, I get it. I understand it all. And I'm supportive of those people. I just wish I could be more supportive, you know? Right. Yeah. You, you almost wish that you can put your yeah. put yourself in their shoes so that way you could understand that and relate at a different level. Right. It's a really weird thing because I, I don't want to do that. And I don't want, nobody wants to do that. Right. You know, it. it's weird. But anyway, yeah. I'm happy to be finally bouncing back. Like there were other complications in like, I ended up with a paralyzed foot because of the surgery, which I've been going to physical therapy for. It's like everything. And then like, I'm trying to get my energy back. Cause like my energy went through the floor too, because of the surgery and you have internal organs that are getting, you can't, that's something I learned is that you cannot rush healing of your internal organs. There's nothing you can do about that. Yes. But I wanted to. So I was trying to like rush getting outside and doing work and this and that. So I'm out there with a paralyzed foot, not really quite back to my hundred percent nearly. And I'm out doing yard work like crazy. And in the first week, I'm doing this yard work. And in that time, I ended up with three monster thorns in the in the fingertips of my fingers. And I was wearing gardening gloves. Oh. So now I have these things in there. And I got poison ivy all over me because I pulled the poison ivy. So now I have a paralyzed foot. I got this stuff I'm trying to heal. I got thorns in my fingertips, which I thought myself, my body would reject thorns. I thought they would push them out themselves. So I'm not telling anybody. I'm just leaving the thorns in my hand. So I had thorns in my hand for a week oh. in my fingertips. I got poison ivy. And then I go to my other neighbor's house where my mother-in-law lives and uh, in that neighborhood. And we were going to try to help her out to like weed out her like walkway. And I do that. I go back a couple days later and I had noticed my poison ivy had gotten a little bit weirder. And I'm hanging out with the neighbors and they're like, hey, did you ever, uh, did you ever have any weird reactions to that poison sumac? And I'm like, poison sumac? And they're like, yeah, there was all sorts of poison sumac in there that you pulled out. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have poison ivy, poison sumac, thorns in my fingertips. I got a paralyzed foot. I'm messed up. And I'm a kind of guy. I still feel like I'm 21. Like, what's going on? <laughs> Man, yeah. it was just. But it's all good. It was just. Oh, but I mean, you you were able to remain positive despite one blow after another after another. Which... And if you let that shit take you down, you're going to be like that person that just sits in the corner and never leaves their house. You know, you can't do that shit. That's an impressive skill. I, I, I'm i the same way, too, personally speaking. I think I I, I try even in negative situations. I, I almost try to control my mind and being like, listen, Somebody has it bad. Somebody has it worse. Somebody has it this. Like, you, it's okay. Like, struggling with this, struggling with that, you can still persevere. And I think that may, maybe you're lying to yourself. I don't know. But I, I, you said you were into sociology. Is that, is that, or like you're, you're fascinated by that? Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. Like, studying other people and what they're thinking and all that. Yeah. So I think I read an article, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago, and it said that when you smile more and when you're more upbeat about situations, that that carries over. And so, you know, I think spreader of love, as we mentioned in the intro, that's what you're doing because you're just trying to spread, spread a positive message, which I think is a really, is a beautiful thing, which I think the world is lacking at times. During your surgery, though, you thought you bought an Amazon shirt. Is that is that right? You thought you bought a shirt? Oh, God, yeah. And then, yeah. But, it, but it wasn't, right? It was a birthday shirt. Is that correct? Yeah, so yeah, I'm a wrestling fan, so I still got I got my Macho Man Randy Savage, all my figures in the back too. Um, I'm a, I'm a I, I'm a big wrestling fan as well. Are you? Yes, yes. NXT right now is the best best promotion going, which is sad. <laughs> yes, I, I I completely agree. I I'm I'm a huge wrestling fan. I love like I loved Tiffy Stratton the other day. I was like that was an incredible match. Like yeah, no, I'm a big fan. Yeah, I told people way before that. I think Tiffany Stratton. I think she. First, I said she's going to be a world champion on the on the main roster when she was like nothing. After that match, I'm already saying that she's gonna she's a Hall of Famer. I think she's a future Hall of Famer. If she can stick with it and keep getting better, she'll be a Hall of Famer. She's yeah. so good. Yep, yep. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. No, I can. T I love wrestling. I do. I do. Yeah. I'm glad that you is that Macho Man. Uh, yeah, this is Macho Man here. Yeah. I, I still I still collect the dumb figures. Oh. Like, I, st I have a CM Punk action figure up there. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. I, I met Bret Hart. So yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I have, um, Eddie Guerrero was my favorite. So I have his like Latino, he, uh, special, uh, belt there. 
So no, I'm a I'm a I'm a big geek. I geek out about that stuff. It's I actually, and this is gonna be we're gonna lose some of your people because of the whole wrestling talk. But um, back like ten years, fifteen years ago, or something like that, there was a wrestling promotion in Boston called the Mill- Millennium Wrestling Federation, based out of like Melrose area. But like they would always pull in like the local guys would be there, and the local guys at that time were like Tommaso Champa and uh, one of the guys that it was. Um, Ivar, that's what he calls himself. Todd Hansen, he's from yeah. the, the Viking Raiders. And like a bunch of these dudes that were like big timers now that were there. And so I was getting into that wrestling promotion, kind of like they wanted me to be the mean Gene Okerlin of it. Yeah. So I was doing things like interviewing them in backstage because they had TV shows, like low level TV shows. One time they put me in the ring at Big Time Emporium in Melrose, which was a place that was around forever. Classic. And they had wrestling matches in there. You know, there probably was like 50 people watching or something like that, but they had me in the ring. And and the goal at this event was they had these guys called the Canadian Canadian Destroyers. No, that's the move. Something like that. And they were the tag team champions and they were real. They were pretty good. And uh, one of the guys didn't re-sign or or no showed the show or something like that. So the other Canadian Destroyer was there by himself. And they were like, we got to book ourselves out of this thing. So the guy who ran it, he has passed away since, but his name's Dan Marotti and he's a legend in wrestling. Um, he was like the Iron Sheik's best friend, pretty much. They got into a car accident together, which was big. Oh, um, but anyway, he uh, he was booking it, and he was like, hey, Jackson, we want to put you in the ring, interview the Canadian Destroyer guy, and then what's going to happen is he's going to you know, get upset with you, ride the audience, and he's going to punch you in the face, and then you're going to fall down, roll out, he's going to get heat, and that's going to set up for the main event, which is going to be him finding a new partner to defend the tag team titles, against Bo Douglas, who's a guy who's a local wrestler who's been around forever. He's a great guy. And his surprise partner, which is going to be you, which is me. So I was in a tag team championship match where it was the Canadian guy and his partner against Bo Douglas and me. I got to get the hot tag, which is when your the partner is getting beat up by the guys. He somehow makes it to you, hits the hot tag. I get tagged in. I, I ran in, and I was supposed to give a, a clothesline to the guy, uh, the Canadian destroyer dude. And then he was going to roll out of the ring. And then I start Bret Hart, like, to the crowd. Like, I'm all excited, showing off. And at that time, he rolls in behind the ring behind me where I can't see him. And he has a steel chair behind my back. And he's about to slam me. Ugh. And out of nowhere, running from the back, comes Jay Lethal. You know he is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Lethal grabs the chair. So, like, the Canadian guy turns around. I schoolboyed him. And I wasn't supposed to, but I, I love wrestling so much. I grabbed his tights and I pulled his tights just so I can get the unfair advantage and show his ass to the crowd. And we won the tag team championships. I was going to say in my research, I did see that you did a semi pro wrestling thing and that oh. you, yeah. So I have that. So yeah, I think that that's awesome. I'm glad that Dude. you were able to do that. That's and so much fun. Part, another part you'll think is kind of funny is the thing that, <laughs> when I was interviewing that Canadian dude, which was supposed to set up the main event that we talked about, yep. he's in there. He punched me in the face. A, I always knew they had open fists, so it's like, it's not a full fist, so it's like, uh, but I didn't realize it actually hurt, and it does. Like, so he punched me in the face, and I go down, and I'm kind of laying on the ground, and I'm partly making, like, you know, playing it up a little bit, but at the same time, I'm like, holy crap, that dude just punched me in the face, and then he's running around, and the crowd was eating it up, the 50 people that were there, buzzing hard, and so this guy's starting to get on an adrenaline rush, and I can see it, and I'm like, oh, no. So I'm laying in the ring. I start trying to make my way towards the outside. He's feeling the adrenaline. So he comes back and grabs me by my hair, picks me up again, punches me in the face a second time. So now I'm like, oh, my, this is so bad. So I'm laying there, and now I'm, like, trying to get out. The crowd's going crazy. So he comes and grabs me again, picks me up, and he threw me over the top rope. So I go bouncing. I don't know how the fuck to do that. I go bouncing over the top rope like a bag of garbage onto the ground, which is concrete floor, people. (laughs) Yeah, there's there's little protection there i've never done it but i mean i've seen it and yeah. but yeah that's i mean that's awesome though it's that's really a good time. cool to see if you're a wrestling fan you know yeah that's fun the, the, i mean i'm glad that you were able to do that because i i saw this tiktok and it was like oh me growing up as a wrestling fan you know how wwf or wwe would say don't try this at home but here you are with your younger siblings or your or your pillows and you're like that oh was God. That was How me. How many times do you tuck a pillow into your stomach, into your T-shirt, and then think you could jump like from the highest thing and do a belly plant? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my worst, my worst wrestling extravaganza or accident was with my brothers. I grew up middle child, five brothers. 
So, and we were all relatively close within five, eight, five to seven years of each other. So we all kind of, you know, grew up with, and the testosterone was real. We would, you know, be fighting. So we had bunk beds and I, I loved Jeff Hardy, loved him. So here I, yeah, you, you could see where this is going. So my younger brother, I go, Hey, I'm going to put a bunch of pillows on you. So it's not going to hurt, but I'm going to swanton bomb onto you. And he's like, okay, here I am, and and everything's going well. He has the pillows on him, okay? At the last second, he bitches out, which understandably so, because he was maybe only like, (laughs) I was 11, he was maybe like 8. Rolls out of the way, takes the pillows with him. Oh, no. So smack right on our, our and, and we lived in a we lived in an apartment in Worcester and the uh, the carpet was very thin so it was essentially as if I just smacked on the ground oh, all yeah. I remember is my head dunking and I'm like oh crying I think I cried like a bitch for an hour after because I was in so much pain Did you go to the doctor my mom didn't really do no. My mom re- really didn't do that stuff. My mom was more of the uh, well, you're I'm a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm 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 the nurse, and you're a dumbass, and that and you you reap what you sow type of deal. So that that was uh, it was tough love. It was tough love. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's proof. If anything, we know that you can live with like a a concussion for that long a time. It's good. That, it, you know, it's funny. I I wondered how come I had post concussive syndrome even after yeah. that playing high school sports and stuff. And did now you? I did, unfortunately. I that was so. Un- I actually had to stop playing competitive sports because of how much concussions I had from football and soccer and things like that. So anything had to do, probably not. Nothing had to do with the Swanton bomb off the. No, I don't think so. It, 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 it was, I mean, maybe it did. I don't know. I probably, you're probably right. I was probably concussed and didn't realize it. Um, so to put it this way, I, oh, wow, I know, man. I know in my life I've had at least 10 diagnosed concussions. Oh my God. Not to mention it, it got to a point that even in high school where my friends would be like, don't get too close to Nathaniel's head. Like we have to protect him like type of deal. So. Wow. What did you play in football? Were you a running back? Yeah, or you like- yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you guessed it. I was fast, so I was like quick, and I was able to see seams. And but when you're only five seven, and that's me being generous, and and I was maybe a buck forty when I graduated high school, so I I was getting destroyed. Even though even though I was quick, I was getting destroyed by. 240 pound lineman every time you got you got tackled you were getting destroyed like that's a lot man yep so yeah no i and even just freak accidents like there was one um a group of friends and i I don't know why we did this hacky sacked we you know the hacky sack some of these kids nowadays might not know what that is but it's a little ball with sand and rocks and stuff and you kick it but i i would hacky sack with my friends and there'd be times where we would try to save it one time my friend just got up and I, I was trying to go low and he went up and he accidentally kicked me in the head. Uh, and he was just like, Oh my gosh, are you okay? And I was like, Oh yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. But as I went on that night, I felt wonky in my head and I knew it. So, but I never went to the doctor so that I probably was concussed, but just Yo, that, that is the hippiest concussion I've ever heard in my yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. A lot of kids would skip class to do, stuff like smoke weed or, or, or take a couple nips or what have you. We would skip high school class to go play hacky sack. That's what we would do. We would so love it, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> we would find the little I hallways. In our... I learned a lot about you just right now. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I uh, so your T shirt, that's how we started. So it was a wrestling shirt. Is that what it was? Oh well, yeah, right. So I'm in the hospital and like they're giving me all sorts of like dilated stuff that I don't even know what it is, but I know that it's heavy, heavy drugs. And, stuff uh, that I can't pronounce. That's basically. <laughs> and so the, um, yeah, I figured when I got home, I was like, I, I know I went on my phone at some point. I remember realizing that I can like, cause I was stuck in that damn hospital for like four days, five days, whatever it was. And, and, uh, and they didn't let me, I wasn't allowed to eat. So I was on this like chip and dip kind of thing. I think they called it chip and dip, chip and sip. I was allowed to eat. The ice, ice chips ice and sip the water, you know? But those but, ice chips are those ice chips are good. I, oh, I, those <laughs> ice chips, man. The first food they gave me, which was like this like lemon uh like Italian ice. Yeah. Holy 
crap. Like I remember I took photographs of this lemon ice package because I was like, this is the greatest flavor I've ever had. Already the second time I was like, can I please get another one of those? Because that was the best thing I've ever tasted in my life. They brought it to me again. And it's already that whole drug thing where you're chasing the high because they gave it to me in the second one. I was like, oh, not as good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it, but that first one. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. so good. But anyway, so I was in there and I, I realized at some point I can buy things because I have Amazon on my phone like everybody. And uh, so I, I'm pretty sure I must have bought some weird stuff, but I didn't have anything in my out in my cart. So I knew it wasn't from Amazon. So I was like, oh, boy, I, I probably clicked on some stupid Instagram ad and bought something dumb. So. I was excited to see what would show up at my house to yeah. find out what I bought. And one day this shirt showed up and it was like one of those RSV, whatever those shirts are that show up on Instagram all the time. They do like jaws and all those, like it's a button down shirt yeah. that looks kind of nice, but has all over the place, like a, like a dad Hawaiian shirt. Kind yeah. Of thing. Yeah. I've seen those. Yeah. So it was one of those, but it was a professional wrestling one that had like all sorts of pool floaties that are shaped like the rocks logo and stone cold logo and like Roman reigns and all these people. So I was like, wow, I, I had really, I showed my kids. They thought it was hilarious. I'm like, I bought this when I was high at the hospital. And everybody's like, wow. And I'm like, I had great taste. I actually really like this. This is cool. And then I found out my brother texted me like a couple of weeks later. He's like, hey, did you ever get my present I sent you for your birthday? <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, shoot. Sorry, man. <laughs> I, I, but on, on a positive note, you didn't buy anything. So you... I know. No, I'm disappointed. I'm still hoping that something shows up. You know, because I don't have a lot of money in my account. I don't know where it went. <laughs> Something's back ordered, and all of a sudden, in like two months, you'll get a big shipment of a bunch of and, something and, really stupid. And, and you bought the same thing. You kept pressing the plus button, yeah, <laughs> and not realizing like five thousand shark floaties or something like that. <laughs> yeah, something. That's right. Something for the summer, and then you get it in the winter. That's when you'll get it. You'll get it. You'll get it mid January. <laughs> So I want to I want to switch gears a little bit here. So I saw something that said you make your own clothing from fruit and vegetable waste. Can you elaborate on that? Is that what what is that? Is that a thing? I don't know where you pulled it from, but I think I was probably just being a wise ass and putting a stupid stupid answer on something on purpose. No, I don't make clothes out. Of, I don't make clothes out of fruits and vegetables. So, so you're <laughs> just being a wise ass. I love that. I don't even remember doing that honestly, but like I do make my own clothes though, and actually I have like a uh, a pretty cool thing where um. This thing, I'd love to plug it. It's called South Shore Stuff. So for anybody who's on the, the South Shore, during the pandemic, I decided to start this thing. And it's at South Shore Stuff on Instagram is where you can find it the most. But I decided that I wanted to like, along that whole spread love thing. And uh, I feel like I've been very lucky to get where I am. And I, I've been given a lot of opportunities. And I, I'm not saying I've been given anything because I've worked really, really hard to do everything. But I've gotten the opportunity and then worked my ass off to try to do the best I can in that spot. Anyway, it's it's provided a good life for myself and, and helped out with my family, which I'm very thankful for. So I wanted to give back to people who might not have that same opportunity as me. So I started up South Shore Stuff. I didn't tell anybody that I was the radio guy. I didn't say what my name was or anything like that. I started reaching out to small businesses in the South Shore and just saying, hey, I have this thing. And it actually started with a, um, a food truck, this place that was called Morel's Barbecue. They're really good. And they were on the side of the road. And uh, I decided to stop and just be like, hey. I like your food a lot. Do you mind if I make a video on you? I have this thing called South Shore Stuff. Made up on the fly. It didn't exist. But I was like, I have this, you know, and I like to support local businesses and make 60 second videos about them and post it to the internet to try to help you with marketing for free. You don't give me anything at all. I just want to do it. Will you let me do it? And the guy was like, yeah, let's go. So I made my first video. And at that time, I, I, and I wanted to make them 60 seconds so people could, could take them in nice and easy. And, and to me, it was more about like, storytelling about somebody else like it, for me i really wanted to break the ice with them let them know that we're cool and then that whole sociology thing and working at markets in like dallas and baltimore and boston and different formats of music and realizing everybody has a common core and if you're yourself you're cool so i wanted to kind of test it out and go to these people and just get to know them on their level let them know that i'm i'm okay i'm safe i'm all right and then they'll trust me and then if if i'm the one interviewing you with a phone you're looking at me and you're going to trust me and I'm going to ask you questions that you'll trust me. And then I'll be able to help you build a video about your business that you wouldn't be able to do yourself. And I think what I was looking back at all the people that I've been able to interview so many awesome people. Like I was in the same room with 50 Cent interviewing him. I've interviewed Kenny Chesney. I've interviewed Katy Perry face to face, Kelly Clarkson, all these people. And like, so I wanted to take all of that that I've learned and try to help make people look their best who get intimidated from being in front of a camera because that's a lot of people or 
get intimidated by having somebody there asking you questions. I wanted to like help them be their best selves to help promote their business to make them more money. Yeah. So anyway, started the South Shore stuff thing and all throughout the pandemic, I put in like, at this point, I don't even know, over 400 man hours, I think, of like going and interviewing people, shooting stuff, B-roll around them, editing videos down to 60 seconds and throwing them up. I did so many that I, I kind of ran out of people to be able to do. So now I'm going around and doing reviews of, of different restaurants. And now it's the first time where I'm now on camera, not saying my name too much, not saying anything about the radio. But that was the hidden secret that I loved about it, that people would find out later after I made the video, after I posted it, after they got results and started having people roll in, they would find out that that was Jackson Blue from Country 1025. And they'd be like, what the, he never even told me that. And that's what I wanted to do because I, I think everybody gets all wrapped up in these radio personas when, fuck that, man. We're all people. Like we're humans. And like, it's the one thing that has always bothered me. I've had a hard time with authority because once we leave this building, you and I are equal. Like, so you sitting here and talking down to me and telling me things the way things have to be. And not only about our job, but about things in life, just because you're my boss or my bigger boss. Once we leave here, you're going home to your family. I'm going home to my family, even ground. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm going to treat people really, really nice and try to be cool to everybody and try to do really nice things for people. You're going to be more successful than me. But in the end, who wins? I don't know. And ultimately, I think a big I think what gets misconstrued in today, especially in today's world, is success is measured differently. I that's my personal opinion. I've I've met individuals that are living paycheck to paycheck. But they are so tight knit as a family, and that's and, and that's their version of success. They're happy working, and, and, and don't get me wrong, they work hard. Because you had uh, discussed earlier about children and stuff. I used to work with kids. That's my background. I worked with inner city kids, Worcester, Lowell, a lot of tough cities, yeah, and, cool. and so you build that trust. Because as a parent, you're entrusting this adult with your child. So you want to get to know who they are on a personal level. And so they would start to, you know, ask me questions and things like that. And it, and they would get to learn about me and how I kind of grew up with that with some background. There were times, and this is just, I was young, it, it was embarrassing, but there were times where we didn't have food and, and the light wasn't on. And I, I always say, I would say to people when they ask me about my childhood, I would say, I was lucky if the lights were on in the fridge. But I was even more lucky if there was something in the fridge, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. and, and I, the reason why I'm sharing this is not for any to garner any sympathy. It's because I understand that, and I understand that the even playing field. Because there would be times where I'd look at certain kids, or I'd look at other people, and I'd sit there and say, "Wow, they have they have more than me. They're better than me. They're this. They're this." And it wasn't until I started getting older and realized and, you know, the nuances of life, how they're teaching you, where I'm like, like you said, at the end of the day, you bleed red, I bleed red. You shit, I shit. Where, where you, so you may have more money in the bank than me. So what? That doesn't mean you're a better person no, than me. I'll Nothing. I'll demonstrate it right now, man. I could demonstrate your point because like, A, I, I started working, my first job was 14, I was making $14,000 a year. And that wasn't that long ago. I know I'm older, but it wasn't that long ago. That was crazy. Now I'm making way more than that. Like I'm make, making a good amount of money. And I can tell you, life, you always have problems and you always have the same struggle. Although the struggle changes, you always have the same struggle. And the point I can send home right now is, A, don't ever be embarrassed for that, man. That's not an embarrassing thing that happens to you in your upbringing. I'm embarrassed on the flip side. And, and this is how I have always felt because I have always felt that I, my parents were pretty well to do, like not rich. We were not rich, but I lived in South Burlington, Vermont. I, I had a house that had a pretty nice view. Like things, things were comfortable. My dad worked his ass off and we always were, I had what I want. My Christmases were ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I have guilt about that now, especially when I talk to somebody like you or somebody else who you and I are a lot alike. We, you know what I mean? Like we have, I can tell you're a very positive person. You're really good at what you do in talking to people. You're very open and, and you're a great person from what I can tell in the short time I know you. Thank you. Thank you. But you came from the opposite upbringing that I came from. And I think we have so much commonality between us. You know what I mean? Like where 
I think that shows that we all bleed, we all shit, and we all have our shit. We all have problems that we go through, but, and to us, that's the most, the biggest problem. For somebody like you growing up, that was problems I don't even understand, but we all have shit, you know what I mean? And we all can be cool to each other. Exactly, and on the flip side, you know, there's two sides to every coin. You had stuff as well. Just because you may have grown up in a little bit more comfortability doesn't mean you didn't have shit. And that's something I had to learn. I had to learn that just because my best friend, his house was so big, I remember they would have to press a button in an intercom to like get to talk. And here I was. I was growing up in a two-bedroom project apartment house, and I was sharing a room with five other or four other brothers. So yeah. it, it's just it, – it, but – it wasn't until I grew up where I realized that we're the same people. And you know what? He's, he loves me. It, it, there's, no, there's nothing weird about that. And because for a while, you almost diminish your own value until you realize, wait a minute. You can still be loved. You can still be appreciated. People can still like you despite where you come from or despite what you have because that doesn't define who you are as a human. Oh, what defines who you are always is how cool you are to other people, man. Yeah. Like. It it doesn't matter. It, it does matter. It does matter a lot where you are economically, all that kind of stuff. But I can tell, man, on every level that that I've met, and I think everybody can relate to this, you can meet people who are the poorest of the poor, who are the nicest people who will do anything for you, who will bring you in and cook you a meal when they don't have the money to cook for themselves. And then you can meet people who are on the top of the top. And a lot of those people... I, Man, I relate with the people on the bottom of the bottom way more than I relate with the people on the top. But everywhere in between, you're going to find people who are on every level who are great people and who are assholes. You're not great people, assholes. Every type of people. Yep. Like you can find, talk about religions, talk about races, talk about whatever. You're going to find people who are great people and you're going to find people who are dickheads. It's just the way it is. And, and, that, and I love that because that is, always my, that is always my argument. My argument is always... You can just be an asshole. Like, you don't have to be a certain thing. It has nothing to do with this. It's just, you're an asshole. That's what it is. Or you're an amazing person. Or you're a good person. You have a good heart. You have a pure heart. So I think you and I are two kindred spirits in that regard because I definitely I definitely feel that right here. So You know what else I think? It's, it's a weird thing to say, and I know racism is a horrible word to say and all that, but, like, I also – and I'm not calling it racism. I'm not looking to make a big statement here or anything like that. But I think, like, people need to check themselves when they start talking about I love all, insert whatever it is here, you know, type of people. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it doesn't make you cool with whatever group of people you're talking about to say, oh, I love whatever. You know, like, I love gay people. You can't say you love all gay people because you know what? There's some really nice gay people and there's some dickheads, just yeah. like everything else, you know? like, And I think it's kind of rude to whatever segment of people you're talking to to assume that you love all of them just because they're that person. You know what I mean? Like, I think we got to be agree. careful about some of this stuff. No, I, it, it, it's, I, I know exactly what you mean because I, I've had conversations like this with my friends uh, it, similar to what you're saying. So it, it, since you're putting yourself out there, I'll put myself out there. It's the same thing with, like, the, for me, the toxic masculinity crew. And, the, and what I mean by that is, is when you hear somebody say those things, They'll, I'll say, well, what is toxic mas masculinity? Because I'll never tell someone they're wrong. I just want to hear their point of view. And they'll say, oh, it's a guy who is a douchebag or is a jerk or is an asshole. And I sat there and I said, well, doesn't that just make him an asshole? Doesn't exactly. it, it, like, it has nothing to do with who he is as a, his masculinity. It's just simply he's just an asshole. But I sat, I sit there and I'm like, well, you know, like, what if we just reframed it and said, he, you know, I just don't like assholes. I don't like jerks. I don't like bad people. And I think that that's kind of where I'm at with how we are. Like, I love to be around happy people. I love to be around people that are positive. I don't care of your affiliation. I don't care. I, I just love, like you said, spreading love. I love that. To me, I think the world is missing that. And I'm not trying to get all corny and things like that, but I think yeah. – it's mi it's missing a lot in today's world. I think it's missing in today's totally. world. And I think I think we need to. Uh, I think we need to like make it, and that's kind of why I put that up on my profile. That I spread love is always a big thing for me. Is that I think we need to make it normal to say stuff like that. Why is it? Why does it make you weak to be able to say you want to love somebody that you want to like appreciate people? Like why right. is that? 
and I don't care. I'll, I'll get hung for it all day long, man. I don't care. Like I, I'm weak. I, I'm also weird and I'll make weird jokes about stupid stuff, but also like, I love people and I want to see the best in people and, and I want to help people make me better. And I want to help make people better. You know what I mean? I think we could all do that for each other. And I don't know. I think the fact that we make that seem like a, a weak thing to be all talk about that is so lame. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think, and it's tough because when you're young, they teach you love everyone, be, you, you know, accept everything, be positive. And it's almost like the, di- the shift, the dynamic shifts a little bit. And now it's, oh, it's weird. You don't, don't be encouraging. Don't be loving. Whereas when you're a kid, it's no, you know, love is love. Be happy. Be, be, be who you are. And, and like I said, then you get older and then it's like, you're, no, that's weird. That's weird. And yeah. So or even like when you're, and I don't know if you listen to Gary V or anything like that, but I think everybody kind yes, of hears him at some yes. point. Yep. But like, there's one thing that he says that I have taken to heart. And I think I already took the heart way before I started hearing him saying it. I will call if I'm, if I'm listening to radio and I've loved radio since I was before nine years old, I've loved it forever, you know? And like, I was the weird kid in middle school, high school who was like, Oh, Shane, he loved, I was Shane. That's my real name. Oh, he loves the radio. Like it was kind of the thing that went with me, you know? And um, now when I'm, and I'm listening, I, I want the next generation to be good. Like I want the next generation to challenge me. I want them to, to be better than me. So I have something to try to be better than. So I will go around and when I'm listening to the radio, if I hear something, I think somebody I think is really good. I always will either call them or message them or something and not just say, I think you're really good. I'll say, I heard this break where you said this, this, and this. So you know that I've been listening. And I'll be like, that was genius. That was brilliant. You sounded great that you did this. And I try to do that for as many people as I can, just because I think it's so important and because it's going to make me better. You know what I mean? Like, it's a little bit selfish. I want you to be better. So you make me want to like try to be better than you because I want to be the best in the world. That's bottom line. Like I legitimately started saying it to everybody around me like a couple of years ago. I want to be the best in the world when it comes to radio, not morning show because I tried that and that's not my thing. But outside of that, I want to be the best in the world. I don't think I am right now. I think there's definitely I can name people that are way better than me, but I want to be the best in the world. So if I try to raise everybody else up, that's what Gary Vee says. You want to like raise everybody else up so you could try to be above their level instead of trying to knock people down so you could be the highest building. You know what I mean? Like uh-huh. that makes so much sense to me. Like I would rather beat people at their best than knock them down and make them feel horrible just so I can win. But I think what has made me successful over a long period of time in radio has been being able to evolve. And I kind of like being in the front, not in the front. I think I'm in the front in a very weird way where I, It's always been my goal on radio to try to do things in a short period of time that's going to surprise the listener who's listening, you know, because I think a lot of times when you're listening to radio, we're in the background, you're listening to your favorite music, the the radio DJ might talk and you might not even understand, might not even hear, might not register what they're saying. And I know that that's the truth, you know, because that's the way I listen as well. So I like to try to do things that'll be like, what the fuck did he just say? What? Like things that'll be like, that doesn't belong on the radio. You know, every once in a while, I like to do that just so when you're listening to me, you know, you have to kind of pay attention because I might say something that's a little bit fucked up that you're not going to like hear anywhere else on the radio. That's a little quirky. Yeah. I can't do it that often though, because if I do that, then I fall into that little category over here, which I fall into a lot, which is he can be really annoying. You know what I mean? If I do it too many times, then people are like, that guy's fucking annoying, man. You know? So I, I really have to, I've gotten older, so I've had a better opportunity, and there's more to me over here than over here at this point, so it's easier for me to balance, but it, it, that's my biggest challenge is trying to push radio forward and try to do things that people haven't really done on the radio too much, but keep in my little box at the same time. Something I'm noticing about you is your ambition. You seem like you have a lot of ambition. Is this something that was taught to you? Is this something that you just, in your own head, you were like, I I want to do this. I want to do this. Or is this something where you had some role models or someone who was like, you know, it's very important to try to do that. I'm just curious because it seems like you're, you're, you're have a strong, you're headstrong about your goals and your ambitions. Yeah. I think I have too many goals and I think that's a, I think that's a problem with creatives in general. And there's another thing I want to talk about with creatives because there might be some listening or whatever, but yeah, my dad was definitely my role model. My dad was like, he was a badass. He he worked really hard and uh, yeah, he definitely, he made me, want to do that but at the same time like i never want to stop learning and that's that's my new goal and when i talked about these big things that i want to try to do one was the surgery one was you know trying to switch 
format so many times. Like, I don't know if there's any other jock in the country. I think now there might be, but I think I might have been the first. I'm not sure who went from top 40 to hip hop to country. Like that's a weird jump to do all three of those. Um, and now like even while I'm doing my national show in Boston and raising my kids and doing South Shore stuff. Now every morning I'm waking up and I'm taking classes on YouTube myself, but I put in two hours or an hour, hour or two every day looking up photography and cinematography and video. And, and I'm trying to teach myself all that right now. I'm not very good at photography or cinema. I'm pretty I'm okay at cinematography, but I want to get to the point where I can produce my own documentary. That's my next big goal. You know, I, I, I always want to have these big goals. And when I get to them, I want to do the next big goal. Oh, and here's another one. I told you I was going to maybe talk about weed on this podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I quit drinking a couple of years ago and I drank a lot. I grew up in Vermont. So Vermont, there's a lot of weed smokers around there. I think, you know, it's just the way it is. It comes up in your blood. But the, uh, and when I say this, I'll pre pre state that I don't think weed is for everybody. I don't think weed is for all adults at all. I don't think it's, I think there's a lot of people it's not for, but I think it is for some people. I think it helps some people a lot. And I also do not think it's for kids at all. I don't think any kids, under a certain age, 18, 21, whatever it is, like should be touching that stuff at all. Honestly, through my own experience, because like when I was in Vermont, I smoked a little bit of weed. My friend smoked a lot. I went away, I went to college. I smoked some weed there. My grades were horrible. I quit weed after about a year and my, my grade point average went up by like two points. So for some people, it's definitely not right. In my adult right. life, yeah. weed has helped me so much. And, and everybody always talks about how it's medicine. And when I hear people say that, because I have my medical card, I know a lot of people have their medical card, but it never clicked with me that it is medicine. Every time I would hear that in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, you just want to smoke weed. You just want to get high. I get it. You know? Yeah. Just say, but yeah. After I went through this whole surgery, and this is one of those big things I'm talking about that I wanted to take on, which I think, I think it's really cool. You tell me if it is or not. I don't know. But I was in the hospital, all this shit happened to me and they were telling me, you know, we're going to give you oxycodone to go home with. Now, I know how bad people get addicted to that. I had just gotten, I quit drinking two years ago. Weed helped me with that as well. I don't know if I would have been able to do it if I didn't have some weed. Um, but now I'm like, my dad was a bit of an alcoholic. I never actually was an alcoholic, but I think I was just never really went through the whole thing. And uh, so I'm sitting there and they're like, we're going to give you oxycodone. And, I'll, and I'm like, I don't want to get addicted to, to anything. And I know I have an addictive personality. So I was like, okay, all right. I know I need it because I'm in a lot. Of, like I was just being held together by barely anything at the time. There was it was it was hardcore, man. My internal organs, all that. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take one oxycodone just so I can see what it feels like when they discharged me. When I was still messed up, my wife drove me home. I was high as hell in the passenger seat, and I'm like the whole time joking around, making videos. But I'm in my head thinking. I think I can match this. I, it feels chemical, but it also feels a bit like weed. I think I can match the strain of weed to what this feels like. And at that point, and I, I already been putting in some time studying marijuana and like the terpenes and all, all the different cannabinoids and all the things that make you feel the way you feel and you know, trying to help my mother-in-law with her restless leg syndrome. I was trying to figure out ways that I can blend things to make that help. So I'm trying to become like a medicine man with that stuff. So they're telling me about the oxycodone. I don't want to get addicted. I'm feeling it on the way home. I think I got it. So I get home and I hadn't smoked weed for however long I was in the hospital plus before that. So I was ready to have, you know, get home and have a little something. So I thought I had the strain that it was that matched the oxycodone minus the, the bit of the chemical feeling that I had. So it was this strain called uh, Gary Payton is the one I thought it was going to be. So I got home. I loaded it up in a bong. I went out back. I had a bong hit. While I could barely hold myself together or sit in a chair, I barely could sit up at the time. I was laying down almost all the time. I sat up just to take a bong hit. And then after I took the bong hit, I went and I sat down in a chair. And I, I remember I just was like, ah, oh, and everything settled down. And it was in that very moment, like for real, where it sat in my head where I was like, I understand medicine. I understand the medicine now. And the thing that's wild to me is I should have been taking oxycodone for a week, two weeks, three weeks. I don't know, but I didn't take one more oxycodone pill. I didn't take any painkillers after major internal surgery. Yeah. I only, I only medicated myself with marijuana and I didn't do it that much. Like I only did it when I needed it. Yeah. So it was a proof of concept to myself that yeah, marijuana is medicine. And it also got me through the healing of major surgery without taking any painkillers or any medication. Wow. That, I, that's impressive. Kind of wild. 
Yeah, it is wild. I I wish I could be a little bit more invested in this topic because I, fun fact, I've never smoked weed once in my life, and that's not, you, and that's I don't know why I don't I don't know why because even I I've had major reconstructive knee surgery and I and same thing they sent me home with the medication and I was they I I will admit there were times where I was hesitant I I almost took it because I was like. I need this. I need something yeah. to help my knee. I need it. But I just was like, no, you know what? Nope, don't do it. Don't do it. Because I know how addictive it could be. So, yeah. you, but, you, you went through that whole thing with nothing? You just did like Advil or something I, like yeah, that? Yeah, I, I just did ibuprofen. Yeah. Oh, good yeah. for you. Dude. And hey, honestly, like, again, like, I don't think it, weed is for everybody. So I don't think like you're not missing out. If it's not for you, it's not for you. I don't even know why I never did. Like in high school, I never got when I all my friends would do it. The reason why I never did was because I was always playing sports. And I don't know why I thought that back then it was like, it's going to affect my performance in play. And so I just never did. And I think that that's what it was, because I think back then, obviously now, as I've gotten older, there's much more studies that show, like you said, uh, for medicinal purposes, anxiety, things like that. There's a lot more benefits, and there's even like the THC. There's athletes who are using the lotions or the – exactly, so CBD uh, oils and things. So the, I know that there's benefits to it, but I think when I was younger, I don't know why I had this mentality that it would literally affect my play in the game. So I just never – not once my friends would do it i had a group of friends i had one friend who was a legit dealer of it and he was my best friend and i was like bro it's just not for me i'm sorry and then he was like yeah. okay and he never cared but uh, it, well, well, most people that smoke weed don't really care like they don't that just means more for us you know what i mean so if you don't <laughs> smoke it it's all good man but yeah <laughs> no like i said I, I i don't know why i don't know why uh but i have friends that do and things like that and they've expressed the the benefits to it so i i'm i'm happy I, think, I don't think you were wrong with thinking that either honestly i don't think you were wrong i think with some people i think i think we could negatively impact possibly your your the way you were at sports it I, it might have i think for some people it helps them get a better workout and do better yeah. i think it just comes down to the individual i actually got kicked off my basketball team in in high school and i loved basketball i was a big time baller and all that and like um, I got kicked off my team in high school for smoking weed when I didn't smoke weed. I was just weird. All my other friends on the team were smoking weed, but I was like the only one not. And I got kicked off for smoking weed just because my, my, my coach thought I was weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we live and we learn. I, I know you're, I know you're short on time cause you got to get to work. So I'm just going to ask, ask you some rapid fire questions. And we'll get rolling, and we'll have to have you on again because this was awesome. I could have talked to you, Daniel. You're awesome, man. You do a great job, and I, I really appreciate this. This has been a fun talk, and I hope I didn't say anything that made people hate me. No, <laughs> not at all. I could have talked to you for two hours. So, um, so we'll go with some rapid fire questions. What is it with you and your Seven Eleven Slurpees, and what flavor do you get, dude? I don't drink them a lot because I know I'll probably get diabetes if I do that. But my girls love it. It was something that is something. Okay. I think what what shaped me as an individual from a very young age up until this age right now is pop culture. Pop yeah. culture has shaped me. Like when I was a kid, me and my brother and my mom and dad, we would hit 7-Eleven and some of my favorite memories were trying to collect all of the uh, the USA basketball team cups. I think that was McDonald's actually. But 7-Eleven had like the um, – they did Marvel superheroes on there. So it was all – And they did wrestling. I've had – I have yes. I have some old school WWE ones. So, I yes, I know. I, I loved that. That's that is part of what shaped me. Trying to collect all those cups yeah. at Seven Eleven or McDonald's or whatever, you know, like they don't so, do that anymore. They don't. No, do that they anymore. don't. But I still love Slur uh, Slurpees. I think there's something. I don't know what they do to get that extra little flavor in there. I don't know what it. I think it's crack cocaine or something because it's just <laughs> like this. It's this tingle, and like I'll drink any of them. Every single kind you give me, I love it. it when I was younger, my stepfather would take us because he was the one that introduced us to. 7-Eleven Slurpees, and at the time it was dirt cheap for even a large. I think it was maybe... Well, they are. They still are. Oh, are they? Yeah, so I, 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 it's been a while. It's been probably like 15 years since I, my last Slurpee. But he would take us, 
And I remember I would do the whole, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit yeah. of this. I did a little bit of everything. I mixed it up. It was, uh, what did what they call like the Graveyard, suicide. man. Yeah, or, or graveyard. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I used to do that with the drinks at McDonald's, too. I would go a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. You're stopping that, by the way. Do you see McDonald's is not going to let you self-serve your drinks anymore? So now you're going to have to bother the person, the poor person who's trying to get the French fries and everything else. And you're going to be like, dude, can you please just push every one of those just for like a half a second? No way. Wow. Man, yeah. man. Taking, taking power from the people. Okay. Yep. Tyrannic uh, McDonald's. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so what is the weirdest thing that you've seen at the food store because i heard you asked that on the radio the other day so i want to hear from you what's the weirdest thing that you've seen at the food store that's the worst thing man like i think i should you know what you just like taught me something i need to like start thinking about things that i have answers for before i ask them on the radio because how can <laughs> i expect anybody else to have an answer when i don't have anything i've seen all sorts of crazy things the craziest i can't even think of right i think i'm normally like me and my girls my my family when we go we like to act we like to do weird things just to like to give people and to let to, to have somebody else see something that's odd. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like I like to go places and I did it. I, I can't believe I didn't get in trouble because it was during the whole COVID thing and everything. Like when I go to like the airport, I'll just be walking with my family and all of a sudden without telling them, I'll start doing something really, really weird. Like I'll just start running places on purpose, like <laughs> running one place and then stopping and looking around and then running to another place. And people like will look at you like you're totally something really bad or even like today we have all sorts of turkeys i don't know about you but like we have turkeys in our neighborhood walking all over the place i don't even know why i'm bringing this up i'm not going to finish this never mind it's is, a it, really is it is it the is it the turkey, oh, the turkey is it is that what yeah they it is right you is it, a lot of shit didn't you is it but isn't that what it is though yeah they have that little turkey no yeah. what i was thinking is i thought it would be really funny is what if we um oh and by the way uh, that thing that hangs from the turkey that's what we're talking about that's yeah. like this piece of hair that i thought was a turkey penis coming out of their neck because it looks like one but yeah. the um i i was like well, lily we're driving her to school today my girls and i'm like those turkeys you know what would be really funny i i think how weird would it be if i decided to start because they walk all over the town if i start walking with the with the pack of turkeys if i just start walking i start showing up in people's yards <laughs> and i look and i'm looking around and if they make a noise I'll just look at them like a turkey does, like a, and 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 then just run and then just book it. <laughs> no, I'll just do what the other turkeys do. If they hang out, I'll just hang out too. I'll stay strong. If the turkeys start <laughs> taking off, I'll start taking taking off with the turkeys. You know, like, and I was like, but if I were to do that joke, it would have to be a long term joke that yes. nobody is in on except for me and my daughters. Yep. And then at some point they would say, "Do you see that crazy dude that walks around with the turkeys all over the place in hole?" And I'd be the crazy turkey guy. But my question with my girls is. Do you think I would eventually actually become crazy or actually start thinking that I'm one of the turkeys if I ran with them for like a summer? You would go viral. You would go viral. Right. And people would sit there and go, turkey man. Like they, that would be a sensation. It would be. Is it worth it though? Because then I'll always, be, I'll always be turkey man. You know, or, or yeah. if I decide I want to drop it at some point, then and, I can't be a normal person because they're going to be like, oh, there's that weird turkey. Oh, they, there's turkey man. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That is, that is, that is true. That is true. Yeah, because in my city, there's a, a person who's driving around in, like, a little electronic car. And I mean, like, a little one, one that a five-year-old. And he's on the street doing it. And he's blowing up on TikTok. Because, really? And, and now people are... Yeah, no, I, Lowell. Now Lowell. But Lowell, that's okay. but that's what people are literal Lowell Mass, where people are... It's, it's all over TikTok now. I'm he, talking about it on the radio today, man. No doubt about it. Yeah. I want people to give me the sightings. What, is he called something? Are they calling him something? I don't, I don't know what they're calling him, but he's blowing up on TikTok. He drives a little electrical red car, and he... Is it, he, a, is it a Power Wheels? A, a, something like that. It looks like... It literally looks like a Mario Kart. Like, because it's his yeah. knee, his knees are up to his chest and he's like this. And he, so if he were a Mario, if he was a Mario Kart character, he wouldn't be one of the. Would he be like more like a Donkey Kong or like a Wario, or would he be more like the little like a like a he? A Yoshi? Yeah, he'd be like a shy guy. He'd be like because because so he's short and stub. Yeah, because he wears all like he wears all black and he wears like a hat and he. he I, I'm gonna give this man credit. He's sticking through even on a hot summer day. He's driving around. And he, he's in his little thing with a black sweatshirt, black sweatpants, black hat, and glass sunglasses. And that's, I love it. And I want to go find that dude and inter. You know, that's the kind of stuff I think of. Like, now I want to go take my cameras and go to Lowell and hunt the dude down, talk to the guy, 
get to know the deepest part of this guy. Like what started this guy? Where is he at? And then eventually throughout talking to him, make the de the declaration without telling anybody whether he's nuts or he's a, a normal guy, like who knows what's going on. Like yeah. maybe, maybe he's like me. Maybe he just wants to do something and like try to live with turkeys for a summer and see what happens. Yeah. You know, maybe that's what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think so. I think you're on to something. Think so. I think I don't think I don't think so at all. I think he's probably very odd, but I still want to talk to him. <laughs> so would I No, I would love to get him. What conspiracy theory do you most believe in? Aliens, 100%. Me too. Me too, dude. Is that a conspiracy theory at this point? Those people showed off those two little dead aliens. Those things weren't real. Those were toys I played with when I was a kid. Did you see that story? <laughs> I did see that story. Yes, I did. In Mexico, they brought these, and they were only like this tall. And like, I'm like, yo, were those things like walking around with regular human legs and human arms as a, this tall with like a weird alien head? Like, Right, yes. I don't, um, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. But I think, how can there be that many stars out there that are all little suns mm -hmm. in galaxies, multiple galaxies out there with all those suns in theirs as well, and not have another one that has life like us? It's right. not possible, man. I don't think so. I, I agree. My, my, my argument to that rhetoric is always, we don't even, supposedly, we don't even know everything that's in the ocean. So how do we know everything that's in outer space? That's, that's always my argument to that rhetoric. It's like, we live on this planet. We don't know everything that's even in the ocean. You can't tell me you know everything out there. So that You're is... right, because we do keep finding things in the ocean or in the sky or new bugs show up or something like things that we have never seen. The, the rainforest, we don't know what's in the rainforest yet. Right. We still don't know. Like, how you saw, like how you saw that, what, the sea butt? Is that, is that, see, I do, <laughs> I, do my re, I do my research. I do my research. I'm, I'm blown away with your research, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I pride myself on that, but you're right. We don't even know everything in the rainforest. So, well, Jackson, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit and chat with me. I had an absolute blast. Plug in your socials. Where can people find you? Obviously, they can hear you on the radio, Country 102.5, but where can people find you on socials and things like that? At Jackson Blue Show is uh, Instagram. You can find me on Facebook if you still do that. I, I still use it because I'm old. And then... Uh... <laughs> I got threads. I don't use it, but I have that. You know, I'm everywhere. And then at South Shore Stuff, if, if you're from the South Shore, I would love some people to check that out because that's honestly something I really, really believe in. Like radio is just me goofing off and acting silly, but I think South Shore Stuff is actually making a difference, which makes me feel good. I will, I will check that out then. Well, Thanks. Jackson, I appreciate you coming on, my friend. You're a friend of the show. That's almost like joining an elite stable in wrestling okay so now you're a friend <laughs> of the show all right i i i i i'm the i'm the i'm the what is it Ro i'm roman i'm the i'm the one who no no oh bloodline we're bloodline yeah. if, if you're roman reigns then i'm definitely like solo sokoa if that that's right yes you are yes you are so that is going to do it for this episode of the razor flexion podcast like comment and subscribe share the show so that way we continue to grow Follow me on the socials, and you know the deal. May you live, may you love, and may you thrive. I love you all. Hey, everybody. I have something to tell you. I've gone crazy. Some would even say I've gone mad. That's right. I've partnered up with Mad Rabbit to help revitalize, replenish, and restore your tattoos. With bombs, lotions, sunscreens, and more, all specifically designed for skin with ink. And get this. If you're looking to get your first tattoo, we even have numbing cream, as well as patches for the aftercare. Get whatever you need today at www.madrabbit.com and type in Reyes Reflection at checkout for 20% off your order. That is Reyes Reflection, 20% off your order. Get yours today.